Welcome back for the final part of the conference. After the concluding panel, in a short award ceremony, President Draghi will hand over the prize to the winner of the Young, Econ Young Economist poster session, and then we'll have the group picture of everyone in the courtyard. So please don't run away, but at the same time, please take the time to answer the feedback, uh, feedback survey on your iPad. It's essential for us that we can improve the conference for you next year. I've also been asked about the dinner tonight. Buses will depart at 6.30, and the dinner is hosted by Banco de Portugal. And now, without further ado, let me introduce Governor Fluke, who chairs the concluding panel with Governor Carney, Governor Kuroda, Governor Polos, and, the Pres and President Draghi. And after the panel, we'll have a short Q&A as well. Over to you. Thank you. Before Governor Fluke starts, just wanted to thank all of you, also in the name of uh, my ECB colleagues, Bank of Portugal, all the staff, and all the presenters and the panelists for the insights they have provided, and for the lively debates we, we had in uh, the last two days. The discussions about the relationship between investment growth and productivity in advanced economies have indeed been illuminating and thought-provoking, and will continue having a conversation on these issues just in a few minutes. Governor Flug. Thank you very much. So first, let me thank you, uh, President Draghi and the organizers from the ECB for inviting me to moderate this uh, final panel. Before I invite you to actually uh, present your opening remarks, let me share with you some insights about the experience of Israel, which has been named Startup Nation. It was already mentioned. Uh, due to uh, the very active startup scene we, uh, that we have in Israel. We have some 5,000 startups in very broad uh, range of areas from cybersecurity to fintech, clean energy, uh, agrotech, and so on and so forth. The high density of startup activity has been attributed to a number of factors uh, some of which are captured by various measures of the degree of innovation in an economy, uh, and others may have to do with the way the country has evolved and the challenges it has faced. The World Economic Forum and Bloomberg publish international rankings of innovation where Israel ranks high. These rankings uh, measure and show the level of universities that provide econo the economy with a scientific basis and technological abilities, the close link between the academia and industry, the extent of government support, at least earlier on, uh, to commercial R&D, and the high uh, developed venture capital industries as factors that made key contribution to the innovation-based economy. Adding to that, I would add the need for sophisticated intelligence unit in the army, where young, talented people gain experience in various digital environments, including, for example, in the area of cybersecurity, or the need in civilian areas such as water supply, for example, for a country that is characterized mostly as desert, uh, which led to important innovations in areas such as drip irrigation, water desalination, water recycling, and so on. So basically, you can say that necessity is uh, the mother of invention. To all of that, I would add a cultural element. Uh, some call it chutzpah. And that is the willingness to explore new ideas, fail, learn from your failure, and then try again. As the vast majority of startups actually fail, and only a small fraction end up being great successes, success stories such as Waze or Mobileye. Mm -hmm. However, this is only the bright side of the Israeli economy. A more complete picture is that Israel can be characterized as a dual economy. One economy that is knowledge and innovation based, that is dynamic, internationally competitive, and attracts highly educated individuals. And the rest of the economy that is characterized mainly by lower productivity and low wages. 
Innovation is limited mainly to the high-tech sector, which at its broadest definition accounts for only about 10% of the uh, workforce. Uh, and actually it's among the highest among developed countries, but it's still only 10%. The rest of the economy is benefiting from innovation only to a small degree. There is a limited diffusion of innovation into the other sectors. And it is not adopting cutting edge technologies developed in the high tech sector or elsewhere. This economy is unable to compete for talent that would facilitate actually the adoption of advanced technologies in these other sectors. So the outcome is that of a polarized, polarized dual labor market resulting in high income inequality. The top notch skilled labor being absorbed and very well compensated by the high tech sector. As I said, about 10% of the employment and the other 90% are mostly low skilled employees, less productive and earn uh, lower wages. Uh, how to facilitate and provide incentives for the adoption of innovative technology by the rest of the economy, how to encourage diffusion, what skills need to be provided by the educational system that would make it possible to adopt sophisticated cutting edge techno uh, technology in these sectors, how to help the diffusion of innovation, to the rest of the economy. These are some of the questions and challenges that need to be addressed in order to reach an inclusive and sustainable growth so that the benefits of innovation will be shared by the society at large and not only by a privileged few. Uh, so this is the Israeli experience and I want to turn now to the questions uh, of the, that the panel will address. And the first question is really what does uh, the issues that have been discussed uh, in this uh, conference uh, have to do with central banking and with monetary policy or to what extent? Uh, it's clear that the basic solutions to the challenges that were discussed here lie outside the policy domain of central bankers. These challenges these challenges have to be addressed by the composition of government spending, by the composition and structure of taxes, by structural policies, and clearly trying to focus monetary policy on these issues will further overburden monetary policy. But still, the question is if monetary policy and more broadly if central banks' policies uh, can have a role in supporting higher productivity and inclusive growth. So this is the uh, issues that I'm sure will be covered by our distinguished uh, panel. And let me invite President Draghi for his opening remarks. Thank you, thank you. As a, first of all, I agree with you that uh, monetary policy should not be overburdened by other tasks besides the many it has now. Uh, but having said that, still we can't uh, underestimate the importance of, uh, of, uh, of uh, innovation of uh, productivity, and of growth. And uh, they are uh, very important in the informing our monetary policy. We've been seeing in the last, uh, I would say several years, probably 15 years, a decline in productivity, both on cyclical accounts and on uh, trend accounts. I would go to, I'm, I'm sort of relatively confident that as the, as the economy will improve in the Eurozone, and we are entering an upswing in the business cycle, we'll also see a cyclical improvement in productivity. We've seen a pickup in private investment after many years. Uh, after many years we've been subdued, and that's the recent, relatively recent evidence of the last few quarters. So we do expect uh, an improvement on, uh, on the cyclical front. Now, the structural front is more complicated. There, uh, we have to deal with issues that pertain more to innovation and the diffusion of innovation. Um, on innovation, clearly certain policies that foster R&D, the investments in human capital are the first ones that come to mind. Uh, but then we ask ourselves, what is really, uh, if we look at countries that have been very successful with innovation, what sort of uh, 
environment they have that made, made them to be successful. And we had that very interesting presentation by Professor Schmidt at lunch, where he described the ecosystem of MIT. So one very first indication is that we, especially for applied research, to have an ecosystem like the one was described by Professor Schmidt, or, or aiming at that is, for me, it would be probably the most interesting policy prescription. Now, however, to get there, one has to have in place policies that uh, uh, enhance private entrepreneurship, individual initiative, and uh, a cultural environment that is uh, inducive to, to this. So um, to get all this, now another distinction is actually quite important, whether we talk about applied research or pure research. And uh, while we had this, we heard this in this beautiful presentation by Professor Schmidt, while for applied research, really, what matters most is individual private initiative, for pure research, there is a very strong case to have government support. I would suggest that there is a marvelous small book called uh, The Usefulness of Useless Research, uh, which is being written by the director of the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study. He's a, he's a renowned mathematician, Professor Jigreff. I hope to say it correct. It's a Dutch name, so it's always a big problem. But, but um, and there he makes the case uh, that, um, that, that good, pure research will produce the applied results that everybody wants to get. We don't know how many years it takes, and he shows, it makes a very good case, showing that many of the current, of, of the current inventions today rely on research has been carried out many years before. I mean, this Princeton Institute is the place where Einstein used to be for Neumann, and it's the place where arguably there are probably the highest concentration in the world of physicists and mathematicians in the last 20 years. So that's, that's for innovation. But in Europe, we, uh, I hope I didn't insult anybody in saying that, it's just, uh, I didn't say at each point in time. Okay, so, so but, but when you go to diffusion, things are, in a sense, at least as far as Europeans are concerned, easier. And there we, 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 we can see and we have estimates where the largest, the largest measurable progresses in increasing productivity come more from diffusion than innovation. That's in Europe. And so we have to have proper policies that foster this diffusion. And again, we, uh, these are policies that deal with uh, basically product markets, that enhance competition, that enhance private investment, that make the environment, uh, to use words being used many times, growth friendly, growth friendly. Uh, incidentally, um, was well, something I thought that came to mind listening to the, to the paper by David Otter last time. He, he showed, he, you remember, he demonstrated that Increases in productivity within each industry may have a depressing effect on employment, but the spillovers to other industries more than offset the negative effects in one specific industry. Now, I was thinking that to, get, to actually get the benefit of these spillovers, one has to have labor mobility from one sector to another. If there is no labor mobility, either you don't have the productivity increases because they are sort of kept down, or you have, you're bound to have more unemployment and without the benefits of higher employment in other industries. So that suggests what, that we have to have policies that, uh, as I said before, they increase the labor mobility and, uh, uh, and, the, and the competition in the product market. Now, more specifically to our, um, to our own environment in the Eurozone, there are many policies or many things we can, we can sort of do and think and imagine for the coming months that enhance confidence. That's the other thing. It's very difficult to, to have investments that are bound to take several years in an environment where there is no confidence. And fortunately, we are seeing that the environment is changing for the better there. So I would expect that also on that ground, we will be seeing improvement. Thank you, Verne. Thank you very much. Governor Carney, please. Thank you. Um, I brought some pictures, so uh, 
Uh, I'll just speak from up here, if I may. Um, first off, uh, let me thank you, uh, uh, President Draghi, uh, Governor Costa, uh, colleagues uh, from the Eurosystem for this invitation. Uh, it's an extraordinary uh, gathering here at Sintra, and it's been my pleasure to be back. Um, what I'm going to do is a little more pedestrian, because um, a lot of the discussion has been about innovation, cutting edge type technologies, and I'm going to talk about investment investment the cycle, more, more than uh, innovation TFP uh, per se. And I'll use the UK as an example. It's basically two parts of the presentation. Use the UK as an example of some broader trends and some of the explanations for why investment has been weak and just provide a, a few uh, uh, perceptions on that and try to answer uh, Carnet's question at the start, which is what can central banks do? Um, so first thing, uh, I think we all know this, good to put it in context, uh, G4 uh, as represented uh, uh, investment has been weak since the crisis. The UK has done relatively well, but it's nothing to be proud of because actually this is the weakest investment recovery uh, in half a century uh, in, in uh, the UK. And uh, why could that have been the case? Um, well, uh, one explanation is, well, it was a really poor uh, recovery. Uh, it was also the weakest recovery since the Great Depression. Um, but actually the investment share is kind of hard to see on this uh, slide, but the investment share has actually fallen. Uh, over the course of that time by about two percentage points of GDP. It's also the case in, uh, in other advanced uh, economies. Um, another uh, common explanation, of course, is that investment uh, following a financial crisis is particularly weak, not least because of the scarring effects and the restrictions on credit supply. And uh, we certainly had, I, and we can go into detail if anyone doubts it, but uh, plenty of examples of that in the early days of the recovery uh, or the recession in the UK. Um, Misallocation, uh, Chad Jones and others talked about uh, misallocation this morning, uh, quite rightly. This, this, this is just trend capital to output uh, ratios, different scale, which gives you a sense in terms of orders of magnitude of investment in the UK versus other uh, uh, major advanced economies. Uh, basic point, uh, we see these, uh, uh, the capital overhang being worked off uh, in the UK uh, over the course of the next uh, couple of years. So some of the conditions are coming into place for uh, a pickup in investment. Um, zombie firms, often an uh, uh, idea floated uh, for why there's been poor investment. Actually, uh, both as the regulator of the banks, uh, but also looking at macro, we've seen the proportion of zombie firms fall, if you just do them on a basic, who's not covering uh, their interests with their EBIT in the UK. The BIS sees them rising um, uh, across advanced economies. The BIS sees lots of things that we don't see. Um, so I'll just, <laughs> we're more confident in our uh, data there. Now, um, uh, I'm very sorry to have missed um, uh, Ben's, uh, Bernanke's uh, presentation the other night. Um, he's taught us many things, and one of the things that he's taught us, uh, of course, is uh, the option value of waiting um, uh, in investment. And one of the things that is an unfortunate reality uh, in the United Kingdom is that uh, uh, Firms have faced a uh, high degree of uncertainty, not just economic, uh, geopolitical, and policy uncertainty. These are, we all know these measurements are imperfect, but directionally uh, tell us something. Um, and we think that it probably helps tell us why uh, hurdle rates have been so stubbornly high. I'll show you what I can go ahead. That's, the, that, that's a survey of hurdle rates in the UK. Uh, uh, firms at present uh, that we have done at the bank. So think mid-teens hurdle rates. And one of the question is, how do you reconcile that with a, a, a slower secular uh, growth outlook, if you believe anything about uh, what uh, various tenure rates uh, may be telling us, um, a lower real uh, return environment? Um, this is just using a simple Black-Scholes uh, model, um, and I've, I've, I've plagiarized it. I've cited it, actually, so it's not plagiarism, uh, from uh, Ben Broadbent. Um, and just looking at, if you have a slightly higher um, uh, uh, uncertainty uh, around uh, uh, future returns, uh, it's easy to m swamp the reduction in hurdle rates that would come uh, from, uh, from um, lower uh, overall growth outlook. And we do think that is, that is what uh, explains some of uh, what I just said, which is stubbornly high uh, hurdle rates. Um, just talked about diffusion, uh, important points uh, made by uh, Mario a moment ago. Um, we do see this issue uh, quite strongly in the UK data. Th there's many ways to cut this. This is uh, value added per worker in various firms. 
the, uh, the magenta are frontier firms, uh, uh, and uh, the blue and the green are the rest, and you can see that the gap uh, is widening quite significantly. Um, I think labor mobility, which is quite high in the UK, uh, can be part of the explanation here. There's a variety of other reasons. Um, and one of the puzzles in the UK right now is that despite very strong quantities in the labor market, labor mobility is quite low. Uh, so people are staying in their jobs for much longer than you would expect uh, with a 4.6% uh, unemployment rate. Possibly that goes back to the uncertainty question, although uh, that's uh, speculation on my part. But elements of diffusion go with workers. Uh, there's a lot of evidence uh, around that. Um, and if you join um, my mother and my two thesis advisors, uh, uh, you'll, you'll find a, a very tortured explanation of that uh, from my graduate days. Um, now, um, secular forces uh, that are there, um, demographics, importantly mentioned this morning, I'm not going to go into detail, but that is part of the uh, demand element uh, that uh, we think could be there uh, as well. Um, and also, the shift into more intangible uh, investment that's happened over time. I'm sure you talked about it when I wasn't here. I didn't hear much about it this morning. But just uh, with intangibles, I think a number of you know that the investment in accelerator effect is, is dampened. And there is, is quite a bit of evidence uh, around that. It's much harder to borrow against uh, intangible assets. And that's part of the uh, potential uh, solution set here, which is, uh, of course, outside the remit of the central banks. Okay. So in terms of, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, no, there we go. All right, so I want to turn now to uh, Karnit's question, which is what can we do uh, as central banks to support uh, a belated recovery in investment, recognizing that uh, other policies will be much, much uh, more important. Um, first, uh, I think we need to recognize that, uh, well, the cost and availability of finance matters, internal cash flows, um, profit outlook and uncertainty are far bigger determinants of investments than 25 basis points here or there. Monetary policy, uh, its impact uh, comes from affecting companies' profits and cash flows through its effects on domestic demand and by the exchange rate on external demand. And given the importance of internal finance for investment and those high hurdle rates I talked about a moment ago, uh, such indirect effects uh, are much more important for investment, I'd argue, than uh, the effects on the cost of capital. Um, now, the current situation in the UK uh, can help illustrate that point. Right now in the UK, output is approaching potential, uh, and that capital overhang I mentioned a moment ago is, uh, looks set to be eliminated over the course of the next few years. So if companies want to expand, uh, they're going to need to invest, particularly in a, in a tightening labor market. Um, the, the strengthening global economy should tempt them to do so, uh, particularly since UK companies are generally competitive given the fall in sterling. Uh, we have a broad-based recovery, more than our estimate is uh, more than three quarters of the global economy is growing above potential, um, and we're seeing the circumstances in place for a rotation, some rotation from consumption uh, to investment, or at least the indicators of that, uh, whether you look at capital goods orders, you look at uh, global trade. Um, or investment intentions. Um, all of this suggests that there is that rotation. And if those stronger investment intentions are realized uh, globally, uh, there is the prospect of the global equilibrium interest rate rising somewhat, making it a given monetary policy setting more accommodative. Uh, the extent to which it does, of course, depends on other secular factors that have been holding it down, including demographics, again, uh, debt overhangs, and the capital intensity of production. Um, now, in the UK, as I mentioned, uh, there are a series of uncertainties that are pushing the other way, um, uncertainties about how consumers will adjust to a period of uh, weaker real income growth, uncertainty about market access, access post-Brexit, and uncertainty about the potential risks in the transition uh, to a new, uh, new arrangements with the EU and the rest of the world. And so the best thing we can do is, is to pursue the right policies as the bank within clear frameworks uh, to promote monetary and financial stability. With respect to the latter, financial stability, uh, basically what we've been trying to do is remove any lingering uncertainties about access and, uh, to credit, access to finance, uh, in good times or bad. Uh, and this is just one illustration. This is, the, uh, this is common equity, or, or core tier one, of UK banks. Um, 
We've also taken steps uh, such as we took a number yesterday around raising the counter-cyclical buffer, tightening underwriting standards, uh, and recalibrating the leverage ratio. So a series of things, including contingency planning around Brexit, uh, which we do for a variety of reasons, uh, but really our, from an investment perspective, is to take one uncertainty uh, off the table. Um, and I could show you lots of uh, illustrations of uh, the relative success of this. I'm not sure. Uh, where the U.S. high-yield bond market is at present is the best illustration of that, but uh, uh, maybe you can take my word for it that uh, capital is available and it's keenly priced. Um, so let me turn to monetary policy and then finish. Uh, so we, as you all know, just like the ECB, um, operate within a well-established framework. Uh, for us, it's anchored in the inflation target. And we set out in advance of the referendum how we would apply that framework uh, to monetary policy, and we emphasized that the process of leaving the EU would have impacts on demand, supply, and the exchange rate, and that the impact on monetary policy, therefore, would not be automatic, uh, because you need to balance those factors. In addition, what we have done is clearly, uh, as clearly as possible, set out a reaction function consistent with our remit, and this is the important point, is that under our remit, under our mandate, um, when we are in, quote, exceptional circumstances, and Brexit is an exceptional circumstance because it has brought an exchange rate move and that is itself uh, bringing forward uh, an expectation of a real fundamental uh, shock, uh, a, ch a fundamental hit to real income, uh, we are required by that remit to balance a period of above target uh, inflation uh, with a period of weaker growth. So the primary objective of monetary policy remains inflation control, uh, and since that is the case, any overshoot of inflation above target can only be temporary in nature and limited in scope, and therefore we've been clear that we have limited tolerance um, for that above target infra inflation. So we've been in a situation where since Brexit emerged, financial markets uh, have marked down the UK's economic prospects. Uh, we're in a situation where we can't prevent that uh, uh, weaker real income growth that's likely to accompany Brexit, but we can determine how that hit is distributed uh, between uh, job losses and price rises, and we can support households and businesses as they adjust. Um, and what this chart shows is just, in effect, the trade-off uh, that we've been managing uh, between um, uh, the output gap and inflation, at least in projections uh, two years out, uh, in the light purple is back in a year ago, effectively, if there had been no stimulus. We felt there would be a very large output gap uh, with a modest inflation overshoot farther out, um, and then the path we've charted, and it's going, as you see, back um, towards, uh, back towards the uh, origin. And key point is that um, some removal, sorry, the key point before that is um, when as spare capacity erodes, so as you chart that, uh, chart those uh, dot plots, the trade-off that we must balance lessens, and all else equal, our tolerance for above target inflation falls. Now, different members of the MPC will have different views about uh, the outlook for the economy and exactly where that trade-off uh, will be, but not so much different views of what the lambda should be, in other words, uh, the interpretation of the uh, remit. Um, and so they will have different views about the timing of any uh, bank rate increase, but all expect that any changes would be limited in scope and gradual in pace. And so when we met earlier this month, my view is that uh, given the mixed signals on consumer spending and business investment, it was too early to judge with confidence how large and how persistent any slowdown in growth would prove. And moreover, with domestic inflationary pressures, particularly the wages and unit labor costs still subdued, uh, it was appropriate to leave the policy stance unchanged at that time. Now, some removal of monetary policy stimulus is likely to become necessary if that trade-off that the MPC faces continues to lessen. So you can see the chart and you can, you can plot your view on where it's headed. Um, because as it lessens, the policy decision becomes more uh, conventional or would become more conventional. Um, the extent to which the trade-off moves in that direction will depend on the extent to which Weaker consumption growth is offset by other components of demand, including business investment, and importantly business investment. Um, whether wages and unit labor costs begin to firm, 
and more generally how the economy reacts to both tighter financial conditions and the reality of Brexit negotiations. And those are the issues, some of the issues that the MPC is debating. But what we're trying to do, and we've consistently tried to do, is frame them within uh, a clear framework, a reaction function, so different people have different views and they can anticipate accordingly uh, how it would change. And this doesn't become a factor into business uh, investment uh, because there are far uh, more important considerations uh, that should determine them. Um, and so with that, I will uh, conclude and leave you with a stylized picture of the Bank of England uh, to enjoy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mark, and let me invite uh, Governor Corona, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, a common development among advanced economies during the recovery from the global financial crisis is the weak momentum in business fixed investment and in corporate investment in human resources or wage growth in spite of strong corporate uh, earnings. This situation is sometimes called corporate saving gap. This is particularly stuck in Japan. After the introduction of the QQE or quantitative and qualitative monetary easing four years ago, economic conditions have improved and firms have experienced record high profits. However, Firms are still cautious about increasing investment, in, uh, spending, including investment. In terms of the saving and investment balance, the corporate sector has been in a surplus since the latter half of the 1990s. And now, <coughs> uh, corporate cash and deposits have kept increasing, amounting now to 250 trillion yen, or almost 50% of nominal GDP. Looking more closely into the development in the corporate sector, business fixed investment is on a moderate increasing trend, but it remains sluggish. Investment has been mainly in, uh, uh, on maintenance and repairs and less on capacity expansion. In terms of the corporate investment in human resources, wage growth has been low, standing at less than 1% on an annual basis. This is despite the tightening of the labor market with unemployment rate falling below 3%. The wage growth for full-time workers has been slower than that for part-time workers. While the wage growth of the uh, part-time workers is in the range of 2.5 to 3 percent, as it is more sensitive to labor market conditions, the base pay for full-time workers is growing at less than 0.5 percent. These developments seem to suggest that firms are still hesitating to make long-term commitments. As often pointed out, Business fixed investment has a feature of irreversibility, and wages have a characteristic of downward rigidity. For firms to decide on making new investment or raising base wages, they need to become uh, sufficiently confident about growth prospects. It seems that firms have not yet regained that confidence. The question then is how to achieve stronger growth expectations. The key would be an effective combination of structural policies and macroeconomic policies that lead to a sustained increase in economic growth. Structural policies include regulatory and institutional reforms, and these will raise growth potential. The main components of structural policies in Japan currently are so-called work style reform and investment in human resources. These are expected to improve labor productivity and increase labor participation, especially among women and the elderly. This, in turn, will make growth not only stronger, but also more inclusive. 
as many studies suggest, for economic growth to be sustained, inclusiveness is really essential. Turning to the role of macroeconomic policy, let me mention three points. First, macroeconomic policy can support the implementation and the progress of structural policies. Structural policies could be accompanied by unfavorable economic impact in the short run, such as an increase in unemployment. Macroeconomic policies can alleviate such unfavorable impact by increasing demand. This would support the implementation of reforms that lead to higher productivity in the long run. Second, in order to improve business sector confidence in future growth prospects, it is important to achieve a sustained period of strong economic activity. This is particularly important in the case of an economy that has struggled for longer periods of uh, stagnant growth, like Japan. Once strong economic activity continues for an extended period, and labor and production capacity shortages linger, firms are likely to more actively seek to increase business fixed investment and investment in human resources. Third, in Japan, since the latter half of the 1990s, weak growth expectations have been accompanied with low inflation expectations. The Bank of Japan uh, introduced uh, QQE in 2013, four years ago, and the policy was intended to change the deflationary mindset entrenched among public. At the same time, the government has pursued fiscal policy and structural reform with a so-called three-pronged approach. As a result, economic and price situations have improved in Japan. That said, there is no magic wand to quickly fix the weakness in growth expectations and inflation expectations. As I mentioned earlier, an active combination of macroeconomic policies and structural policies is essential. This would lead to an environment where firms upgrade longer-term growth expectations and more actively make commitments toward the future. Let me stop here. Okay. Thank you very much, Governor Kuroda. <laughs> and we move to the Governor of Bank of Canada. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thanks, Karnan. Well, I'm delighted to be here. It's uh, obviously a wonderful setting. I don't think I'll get a debate on that. It's been a great conference, and I want to thank the ECB very much for the invitation. So I'm not going to try to summarize uh, everything or even many things that I've learned in the last couple of days. I don't have enough time. Um, but what I would like to do is talk about what central bankers actually do uh, when they learn something at a conference like this. You know, something that uh, calls into question one of their basic assumptions, or maybe one of their economic models, or otherwise changes their thinking in some way. Now, central banks can't go around embracing every new shift in academic thinking. Uh, the role we play demands a certain degree of continuity of framework. In fact, we're much more likely to go home and stress test our framework with a new idea. Uh, then maybe shade our judgment as a result. Our framework, uh, I think of it as like a, it's like a nice old house, right? We, we might add a room or redo the kitchen, but we rarely tear down the house and start over. So I like to think of this as uh, this sort of a gathering of new ideas um, as a Bayesian process. So there, I put that in for the aficionados uh, who are here of which there are many. Uh, it's where our priors, the priors that we bring to the table, are summed up by the results given by our standard framework, 
and then we confront those priors with a compelling new insight from new research. Now, there are two dimensions to Bayesian updating. And the first dimension concerns point, point estimates. The new insight or the new model convinces us to tilt our judgment from the old result toward a new result. Probably not all the way, but toward it. And to illustrate, say we start with a forecast of the economy based on our standard framework. Then we take a new experimental model and we use it to construct an alternative scenario. Well, then as policymakers, we have a debate on how much weight to put on that new alternative. And in the end, essentially, we would choose some sort of judgmental blend of the two scenarios, possibly just a small weight on the new one, but, uh, but that's the kind of exercise I have in mind. That's the point estimate. The second dimension of, ba of Bayesian updating is less commonly practiced, uh, but I think no less important. That dimension takes into account that there's now a new range of possible outcomes that's now introduced into the exercise by that new research. The fact is, by tilting your forecast, you know, by putting some weight on an alternative model, also means that you're embracing a wider distribution of possibilities than your original model suggested. And the question is, how do we as policymakers acknowledge that wider range of possible outcomes in our process of policy formulation? Now, there is a literature, of course, on decision making in the face of uncertainty, but uh, it's not that well developed, at least for the purpose that I have in mind here. So what I'm offering today is just some early thinking on this issue. So in practical terms, acknowledging the risk that in the light of new research, there's now a wider range of possible outcomes means moving monetary policy further away from a mechanical rule or a reaction function. Uh, it turns it into a bit more of a risk management exercise. So it means asking yourself questions like, OK, if I base my policy decision on my standard model, but this new model turns out to be right, what will be the consequences for the economy? Now, if those consequences would be undesirable through your policy lens, then you need to adjust your policy plan to hedge against that risk. In effect, you lean in that direction to some degree. So to illustrate, let's consider our discussions at this conference around innovation, investment, and growth, and where monetary policy fits. So for one, one, one session, I, was, uh, I came away with an understanding that technological change will eliminate some jobs in the sector where the change is happening. It'll demand difficult adjustments from those, those affected in that sector. But it will gradually create jobs in other sectors. And the net effect, according to the evidence that uh, David uh, Oldor presented, generally has been positive eventually, in the end. Now, as policymakers, certainly we wouldn't want to disrupt those natural forces. Rather, we'd rather facilitate them. So the process of technological change is inherently unforecastable, yet the risk that it will happen is great enough that we should at least consider allowing for it in our policy formulation. So this would mean doing enough experimenting with the models to understand the risks that you would be taking and ignoring the possibility, and then hedging against those risks. So as a second example, uh, we had some discussions at this conference around the global weakness in investment. And Mark has just given some, some uh, good insights there from the UK. So based on what I heard here, we should be considering whether we have the right model of investment in mind. So globalization and the relative growth in the service sector have made intangible investment far more important than in the past. And some of this is measured, measured well, but there's a risk that much of it is not measured very well. So for instance, the switch to cloud computing is clearly complicating the measurement of investment uh, for, uh, for statistical agencies. So our models of investment industrial capacity are quite traditional, right? And they're very central to our understanding of the inflation process. So if another model of investment dynamics is growing in importance, 
we may need to allow for a wider range of possibilities around that part of our forecast and adopt a policy that reflects that uncertainty. So those are just two possible sources of new thinking that I take away from this conference. Uh, actually, Mario raised a couple of others in his introductory speech around properties of the Phillips curve, the same kind of exercise one could conduct for those kinds of issues. So this Bayesian thought process may be applied to any assumption in our policy framework that looks vulnerable to us, and that would be based on new research. The assumption about potential output, about R star, so on. So managing policy risks in this way clearly moves us further away from mechanical reaction functions or policy rules. Importantly though, it's not an argument for pure discretion in policy decisions. Now, complementary to such a shift is increased transparency around those judgments, and of course, clear and regular communication, all of which is still anchored by our inflation targets. So what I'm offering today is just some early thinking on how best to incorporate alternative views of the world in monetary policy formulation along the way. Our goal is to formalize that process so as to ensure policy accountability through time. Well, that's an active research uh, area at the Bank of Canada right now. So I well, thank you very much for that. So taking from your last comment, what I understand is that having to uh, continuously update our thinking about policy, a Bayesian process, and getting away from a mechanical rule-based policy reduces the probability that we will soon be replaced by robots. So at least uh, in, ter in that terms, we're that's absolutely safer correct. than... <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, we can move now to some questions or comments from the public. So we have about uh, 35 minutes, so we'll have probably two or three rounds. Uh, why don't you start? <clears throat> Thank you very much. I enjoyed all introductions, in particular <laughs> the last one. Uh, Yesterday, we had a beer in the bar discussing all the issues well, which were discussed that, uh, that day. And we didn't agree about everything, to put it mildly. But we agreed that, uh, with the colleagues about one thing, and that, our, that we are confronted with Nigerian uncertainty. So my question to the panel not only to uh, uh, Mr. Polos, but to everybody. How are you going to deal with that night in uncertainty which we are confronted nowadays? Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll take two more questions before I let the panel uh, answer. Yes, please. Uh, Richard Baldwin from the Center of Economic Policy Research. <clears throat> I think one of the, the themes, especially on the first day, about innovation is that there may be an increasing gap between uh, utility and GDP and unemployment. So in, in some sense, uh, the central bank is skating between helping people's lives improve and keeping inflation from going up. But uh, so much of the innovation we were talking about is essentially saying that not only inflation may be mismeasured because of zero price goods and whatever, but that many of these zero price goods are providing utility and, and benefit to people's lives, even though it's not showing up in GDP or potentially employment. I wondered if uh, you think about any of those things in doing your monetary policy, or more prosaically, do, do you think seriously about the GDP mismeasuring economic activity, and do you take that account in your monetary policy discussions? Thanks. Maybe one more on this side, yes, please. Over the past two days, we've talked a lot about investment, but not a great deal about how it's funded, besides the fact that there's an important role for the public sector in primary research. But what about private savings? And what about uh, the main source of private savings in Europe, in particular life insurance companies or pension funds? Uh, and are the panel concerned that recent regulation of these things actually encourages them to invest more in government bonds, say, than in equity? public equity, private equity. We've learned over the past couple of days that if we want to invest in 
intangibles, in green uh, revolution, climate change, we do need more equity type instruments and more long-term investing. Thanks. Uh, Stephen, would you like to go first oh. on the night uncertainty? <laughs> well, why sure, thanks. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, well, anyway, I, I love the question about nighty and uncertainty. I resisted the, the temptation to actually put that in my <laughs> remarks, so thank you. Uh, because it's true, we do face uh, some risks that appear to be sufficiently profound to fall into that class. They're not, you know, well, usually when we think about uh, risk, risks, and that's what I meant when I said that uh, you know, the literature of uh, decision making in the face of uncertainty is kind of in the zone. It's, it's, it doesn't really take into account uh, that sort of more fundamental wrong model versus uh, paradigm shift kind of uh, uncertainty, which, uh, which gives it its limitations. So, but I do think that the, uh, the uh, I do think about that. We, we face some things today that are mainly geopolitical in nature uh, that would be so rattling that you'd need to start, we would have to knock down the house and, and do something completely different. But I think that uh, we do have at least the equipment to think about those things, uh, whether we have the nerve to actually incorporate them is, is your question. So it's a little bit like what we do in financial stability analysis, right? We have these tail risks that, you know, uh, we, we, we think they're low probability, but they have major consequences. We for, focus on vulnerabilities in the system, like, uh, like a crack in a tree, you know, someday the right wind comes along and down it goes, but it's a, it's a one in a thousand event. And so you still have to, though, understand those implications, whether it actually goes to the stage where you are changing policy in some way is a second question. But I think we have the equipment in the way I described to actually understand them. So for me, it would be like, well, what if, you know, NAFTA were changed in a really big way? How would that affect the Canadian economy? That would be a really big shock for us to deal with as opposed to modernizing it or tweaking it, right? So that would be the kind of uh, break that we would need to analyze in that separate way. But I would use the same methods. I'll leave the other questions to my colleagues because I know, I know they're, they're, they're all ready now. <laughs> <laughs> now that I've ragged the puck uh, yeah. for them. <laughs> okay, Mario. Well, just, just a word on, on a second question. Um, measurement errors have always been with us. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, but clearly with, with the better and better technology, uh, we're discovering more and more measurement errors and better and better ways to measure things. Now, there is a transition time. Um, these better measurement systems haven't translated yet, by and large, into hard, uh, hardcore um, measures that you can use to change, to use his words before, to change your framework, to redo the house. So you, uh, so you basically take into account that uh, maybe uh, the uh, assumptions, some of the assumptions or some of the, uh, some of the um, figures you're using are not 100% exact, uh, but it's not enough to change the framework of monetary policy. For example, in, uh, in my speech yesterday, just to make an example, we have quoted one of the problems with Phillips curve is the measurement of the uh, real unemployment. So there is this U6 new measures where you take into account more. Labor participation, participation has increased in ways that we understand up to a point, especially in a continent where there have been large migrations, large inflows. How much of the new jobs have gone to migrants, how much they've not, and so on and so forth. Um, is that enough to make your framework change in a substantial way? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. Rather, the question we asked is, suppose that these measures were correct. Would they hint at a, would they suggest that the reasons why inflation is not responding as fast as we wish to the improved economic conditions are permanent or not? Mm -hmm. We conclude that uh, they are not permanent because these measures, even though not appropriate, uh, these measures of unemployment may actually go down as the economic conditions will improve. 
So by and large, the direction of our monetary policy is not going to change. I think that is, uh, that is what, uh, what I feel like saying on that. Well, on the, on, on the, if I may say some words about invest. Now, that question has uh, um, calls into, into, uh, into mind, really, uh, the special financing conditions that we have in Europe. It's a bank-based continent, no matter what. Still, it has been a huge improvement in, uh, in this called shadow banking. There has been huge increases in shadow banking, but we are still far from being a capital market-based economy. And, and so it's, it's, uh, the, it's, 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 it's true that many private initiatives uh, don't have the same easiness of access to markets that they have in other parts of the world, namely in the United States, first and foremost. One, uh, one measure that could certainly foster progress in this direction is the, uh, I would say, the progress on the capital market union. I think that's, the, that's, that's key. That's key. And that's, uh, that's very much on the agenda of all governments for the next few years. Thank you. Okay. Um, just a couple of comments on each. Uh, one on the, I was in here yesterday, so for me that's a known unknown. Uh, that discussion, um, and uh, I, I you know, associate myself with much of what Steve said around thinking about some of these alternative scenarios, and that has to play in. Uh, I think part, if I may, Steve, to, to, to suggest, part of what, or at least I interpret what you're saying as well, is you can't be incapacitated by these potential tectonic shifts. I mean, people always think they're living in interesting times, and to some extent they are, and so we do have some big... Um, uh, potential changes uh, to the labor market, which may be akin, global labor market, may be akin to, and I look down to Charlie Bean over there, uh, uh, recall you, the work you did about the integration of China into global prices, and you and the Bank of England, I think, were relatively early on understanding the deflationary force of that in the, in the, in the early 2000s, and, and uh, calibrating policy appropriately like that. The BIS, to be positive about the BIS, uh, brought this out, I think, this past weekend about potential shifts in, uh, in the glo global Phillips curve. I know uh, we have to work in the micro foundations uh, for that, but uh, um, professor, um, but we'll, we'll go there. So I think the point, not to be incapacitated, think through and not overreact, uh, and, and Steve's provided a, a bit of a framework for that. Okay. Second thing, on this mismeasurement point, I, I agree with, uh, with what uh, Mario just said. I th but a couple things. One is, if this is so great, why is everyone so unhappy? Um, and I recall, not everyone's so unhappy, but I recall one of our colleagues um, pointing out hedonic pricing uh, and mismeasurement mis in the CPI uh, because the iPad 2 had come out to an audience in Queens. Uh, and there was a furor uh, in the audience, um, and the headline in the New York Times the next day was, let them eat iPad. Um, there is an element here of, you know, we're going to tell people they, they don't recognize how well they have it. Uh, because uh, we haven't been measuring GDP properly. Um, I think to the, where it goes to the framework, you can't change your framework on a mismeasurement uh, issue, as, as Mario said. There's always been mis mismeasurement. It, if it becomes much better, if it is measured much better, and we're in a much more, more sharper disinflation environment, then one potentially has, if we're quite confident about that, uh, the good deflation, bad deflation uh, discussion, or whether you have a mix of it. But that is well down the road, and that is not a signal anyway. Uh, the last point I'll make on Avinash's important question, I, I would I, I'd, I'd make a positive point about the new regulatory framework, particularly with respect to life, life companies, uh, because the matching adjustment, um, which is hugely important uh, to the incentives for life companies, has incentivized not equity investment necessarily, but infrastructure and, and, and long-tailed investment, and uh, those who have the capability of making those types of investments have actually been and I use this term positively, even though we're the supervisor, have been quite aggressive in building up those portfolios. So that, that is a, a, a positive regulatory development. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on the first question, uh, how to uh, address uh, with uncertainty. I mean, if uh, it is uh, technological development uncertainty, I think this is uh, uh, inherent and uh, nothing can be done, probably. But uh, from central bank uh, uh, point of view, I tend to uh, uh, classify various uncertainties 
into external ones and internal ones. And external uh, uncertainties, yes, uh, there are quite a lot, uh, including uh, geopolitical uh, problems uh, here and there. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, these are external. Nothing can be done by uh, ourselves. <laughs> internal uh, uncertainties, uh, uh, I think uh, central banks uh, can uh, uh, at least try to uh, reduce. For instance, uh, uh, policy uncertainty um, um, could be uh, uh, reduced uh, not just by uh, the central bank, but also the government uh, as well. But uh, I think there's uh, uh, room for uh, uh, reducing uh, uncertainty uh, uh, in, in this case. And also, uh, uh, by the way, uh, the central bank, like the Bank of Japan, uh, is always involved in uh, uh, securing uh, financial stability. And financial stability is a uh, 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 kind of uh, 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 buffer uh, to uh, uh, avoid uh, some uncertainties actually creating uh, huge problems. And so I think uh, uncertainty is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is difficult to address, but uh, Certainly, internal uh, uncertainties uh, can be uh, reduced by, by uh, our efforts. Now, GDP and the measurement issue, by the way, in Japan, uh, even GDP uh, measurement is a big issue, and recently the government decided to substantially improve uh, GDP statistics uh, because uh, we found that some irregular uh, movement of GDPs uh, in the last uh, few years, and uh, and uh, and uh, probably uh, R and D investment, software investments uh, are not well uh, 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 represented uh, in uh, the current uh, GDP statistics. So, uh, GDP statistics could be further improved, but. Uh, uh, so-called uh, gross national happiness, uh, something like that, uh, developed by uh, Bhutan. Uh, quite interesting, but uh, whether it's quite useful uh, for us, uh, I'm still a bit uh, skeptical. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for another round, so I start with you, then you, then you, and. We'll take four questions and then. Yeah. Richard Portis, London Business School. Um, I suppose this is a question for the Europeans on the panel because <laughs> it's about um, European financial system. And uh, the issue is this. If capital markets union doesn't really move along at the pace that we would like to see, um, what uh, alternatives are there? The banking system bank assets in Europe have fallen uh, by, I don't know, 6% or so in the past five years. The shadow banking system has expanded by about 30%, right? Now, if we're thinking about financing innovation and growth, is it really sensible, are there possibilities for the shadow banking system to, uh, to play a significant role in uh, in financing innovation and growth, or is it just too risky? Is it, do, you, do you not want them to go there, right? I think that's the, I think that's the question. Okay. Thanks. You're next. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Andre Sapir from, uh, from Brussels. Okay. Now, the topic of this conference has been investment and growth in uh, advanced economies, and I think it's fair to say that uh, much of the discussion has been uh, investment and growth in all countries in the aftermath of the crisis that started basically uh, 10 years ago. But 10 years ago, there was another event uh, that occurred that we have not that much discussed 
in this conference, it's the fact that uh, advanced economies that had represented uh, the largest share of global GDP uh, have assumed since roughly 10 years ago less than 50% of global GDP measured in purchasing power parities. And that share obviously will continue uh, to go down as the years go on. So uh, advanced economies are still very important and all of the countries represented here are, are very, very important, but they are less and less important. China and other uh, emerging economies and some developing countries are assuming a bigger role. So that raises in my mind two questions. One is that there are more actors, and yes, there is not just a G7, there is no a G20 uh, to deal with some of those matters. And you know, how much of a coordination can there be in the context of the G20 as they had been in the past in the context of the G7 if there are some global matters, including for uh, monetary policy, <coughs> Uh, that does require very uh, coordinated action. How much of coordination is there going to be, as far as monetary policy is concerned, uh, among these more varied actors? Thanks. Thank you. That was uh, you, and then you. Okay. <laughs> Jim. Jim Bullock. Jim Bullock, St. Louis Fed. Uh, my question is about model uncertainty. Uh, so the panel has already addressed uh, sort of issues about measurement uncertainty, but it seems like the most profound issue we face is model uncertainty. Uh, really, entire frameworks that are very different would give very different policy advice. And it's even our leading theories probably only have, you know, 30% of the chance of being the true model as compared to all the other models. The other models are, you have even less weight on them. So you have a, a situation where you have leading theories, but they're not really uh, theories that we want to really put really high weight on. So it seems to me one way to deal with this is to have your baseline model, but then have other corners of the central bank that are working on other models that m may be useful in the future, but maybe aren't ready for prime time today. And I'm, my question to all of you is, how much of this is going on at your central bank? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, please. Uh, right here. Yeah, at, in the first row. And then you. And then wrap up. Robert Hall, Stanford. So, there's one person missing from this panel, that's Janet Yellen. Um, and uh, to take advantage of that fact, I'm going to ask a question. <laughs> no, I wouldn't please. otherwise ask. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. And that, that, that question is, the Fed has consistently over-forecast inflation for at least the past six years. That's well known from their published forecasts. Um, is the Fed's policy rate today too high as a result of failing to update its Phillips curve uh, from the sample evidence? And I would require an answer from each of the four of you. Uh, <laughs> okay, can you pass the mic? Yeah. Um, I'd like to, uh, John Mulder, Moxford, I'd like to follow up um, the excellent question that was just asked about modern uncertainty. Um, a question for Stephen Pollos. Um, the Bank of Canada is one of the, one of the banks that, that's been leading the way in, in developing models. Mm -hmm. And you've got two models. You've got um, Totem, which was a DSG model with a particular focus on terms of trade, and uh, Lens, which is a Fribus type macroeconometric model um, in which balance sheets and asset prices can play some role. Um, I'm just wondering. And I think um, Totem probably helped you in dealing with the terms of trade shock that you've, that you've had. Um, whether Lens had enough attention on terms of trade, I'm not quite sure. But the question is whether either of these models um, adequately addresses the, uh, the housing market mortgage debt issue that hangs over Canada, uh, which the IMF has flagged up in the past. You know, Canada was one of those economies supposedly ripe for for a correction in, in the housing market, which, which has never happened. So do either of those models adequately represent the, the risk factors there? Mm -hmm. Thanks. 
Okay, so now we go this way, you. and Governor Corroda, please. Uh, I would uh, make my comments on uh, the increased, increasing role of emerging economies uh, in the world economy, and, uh, and, and then I would uh, uh, make a few comments on model uncertainty and what kind of um, econometric models uh, the Bank of Japan has been developing. Now, uh, G20 was uh, created in 1999 in the aftermath of the Asian currency crisis uh, because uh, G7 countries uh, felt that the G7 framework is not uh, wide enough to uh, include many important uh, emerging economies uh, whose uh, uh, impact on the world economy were increasing. So the G20 was created, and then after the Lehman crisis in 2008, uh, G20 summit was, uh, was uh, created. I mean, from uh, 1999 through uh, 2008, G20 meeting was always finance ministers and central bank governors meeting, discussing uh, uh, various uh, uh, issues, uh, uh, but more or less uh, technical ones. But after the Lehman crisis, uh, uh, particularly the three G20 summit, first in, uh, in, I think, in Washington, D.C., and then in London and Pittsburgh, these three uh, initial G20 summits uh, uh, really made decisive uh, 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 contribution to uh, to uh, combat with the uh, upcoming uh, uh, financial crisis and the upcoming global uh, recession. Uh, so uh, I think already uh, in, in, in this kind of sense, uh, the international community has uh, uh, responded to the changing uh, or increasing role of, of emerging economies, including China and India, and so on and so forth, uh, in the world economy. Second, uh, uh, model uncertainty. I think this is uh, uh, theoretical as well as uh, practical issue. Uh, like the Federal Reserve, uh, Bank of Japan uh, has developed uh, two sort of uh, econometric models. One is uh, typical DSGE, uh, Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium Model, uh, <coughs> which is uh, theoretically beautiful, but uh, <laughs> not always used for our policy simulations. Uh, rather than DSG model, uh, we uh, frequently uh, resort to a typical Neo-Keynesian model. Uh, Maybe uh, theoretically not so beautiful, but uh, but uh, quite uh, practical and uh, and quite useful. Uh, but I I I I am quite sure that this uh, model uncertainty uh, will continue to linger, uh, and uh, and uh, and not easy to uh, resolve because, I mean, this is the. The, 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 in some sense, the, the, at the center of economic science, and uh, I don't, I don't think uh, we can uh, easily reach a consensus or uh, the, the kind of best uh, models, model applicable to all countries and uh, and used by all central banks. Thank you, Governor Corrod. I ask. Okay, the panel is now to be brief. Yep. So uh, we finish on time. Okay. Uh, very quickly, I'll just associate myself with uh, Governor Kuroda's comments on the G20. Um, say that uh, yeah, there still is an ability, if necessary, to have the right conversations between the right central banks. Mm. I wouldn't overemphasize the cooperation side versus or, or the coordination versus uh, cooperation and understanding. But that's an entire other conference. Uh, uh, t uh, topic. Uh, secondly, on the uh, Jim Bullard's question, the only thing I'll supplement, because uh, I think others will speak to it as well, is one of the areas in financial stability land, you do need different models for exactly, I think, 
uh, somebody picked up the point on housing uh, debt and how it's, uh, how it's incorporated. Um, and it's one of the ways that we have thought about and, and modeled out a bit as a financial stability committee, uh, some action on mortgage, uh, on, on restricting uh, high uh, loan to income mortgages because of the amplification uh, effects uh, uh, through the macro cycle, so beyond the monetary horizon. Um, on, uh, I'll pass on your question to uh, Janet on the Phillips curve. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, I think that was a test to see if we'd answer uh, something. Uh, and maybe I'll, I'll stop. Uh, John Mueller had raised it, so that was my response to him. I'll stop there. Thank you. President Strong. Thank you. I'll uh, answer the first question asked by, by Professor Portis. Um, right now, the system is still bank-based. I think we got, in answering your question, we, we may want to make a distinction between uh, between projects that need to access capital markets for their financing and projects that don't need to do so. Most private equity, for example, in Europe today doesn't need to access capital markets. To that extent, is either financed by banks themselves, incidentally, the role of banks, even though the assets uh, in the shadow banking system have increased spectacularly over the last three, four years, banks continue will continue playing a decisive role in financing. But basically, many private equity, for example, are, are financed by banks, are actually being created by banks themselves. Um, on the other hand, and the more, uh, the more, the more uh, innovation, the more uh, new projects will need financing, the more it will be a pressure to have a broader capital markets than we have today. Today, they are quite fragmented. They are fragmented by regulation. They are fragmented by supervision. Each country has their own market supervisor. And they are fragmented by legislation. Each country has its bankruptcy law, for example. So it's, it's really very, very hard to, have a, to, to satisfy the capital needs on any reasonable scale, because you have to have a market which is bigger than the single country. Even worse, very often, the uh, selection of where to issue shares to finance is made not so much on the financing needs basis, but just rather on regulatory arbitrage or uh, legal arbitrage. So in other words, you want, you're looking for to establish a company which has uh, very dubious governance standards. So you look for around and you sample for that. And, uh, and so that's very inefficient. So I, I think whatever we want to say, or not, we should work hard to create this capital market union. It wouldn't make much sense to continue in the way we have today. In the meantime, there will mostly be non-capital non market-based financing for, uh, for most of the small, we're talking about small, medium-sized projects in highly innovative technologies. I think that's the, finally, uh, the expansion of the shadow banking system, and here the, the, the chair of the FSB will certainly have something to say, uh, should be, uh, well, I'm pretty sure they're monitoring it quite closely, but also should be accompanied by an extension of the regulatory perimeter beyond the banking system, of course, because this migration from banks to non-banks will continue in the future. On the G20 uh, and, and coordination, last year, I remember, I think now you made me uh, remember, the speech I gave was about um, enhancing understanding of monetary policies in different jurisdictions, enhancing reciprocal understanding. I wouldn't call it coordination, certainly not, or even cooperation, because each of us is bound by a national mandate. And so it would be very difficult to imagine a cooperation. Um, it's very difficult. No question about that. We've discussed this uh, quite extensively. It's very, very difficult. But there is still there is need for that. Because if one reflects today, one of the major sources of uncertainty in the markets is exactly the different positions that different countries have in the recovery. And therefore, the different positions of the monetary policy stance in the recovery. So that is one source of uncertainty for the markets, it's quite clear. So the more we can sort of talk to each other and, and also communicate, communicate to markets in a way that doesn't increase uncertainty, uh, that, that, would be, that would be very helpful. So the need is there. How to do it is not, it's not simple. It's not, 
Now, one, one thing about Bob Hall's question. Uh, um, let me say that the Fed isn't unique in over-forecasting inflation. <laughs> good company. Yeah. Uh, I think they're in good company. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the questions have been covered uh, very well. Uh, I would say on, uh, on Bob's question, uh, it's part of the code of conduct of central bankers that we never comment on each other's uh, policies. And uh, so thanks for reminding us of that. Uh, the, but uh, I'll deal mainly with the, uh, the question about modeling. Uh, yeah, it's true, the, the bank of Canada has invested heavily in models over the years, and certainly Totem and, and, its, uh, and its predecessor were path-breaking DSGE models uh, that, uh, you know, Totem just extended to include the terms of trade, which is a really big investment, uh, but important for an economy like Canada. And all that work paid for itself in 2014-15 when the price of oil fell and we understood instantly just how that was going to work. And uh, very proud of uh, the folks that built that and the staff that run it for having said, this is what's going to happen. No doubt about it, you need to cut rates. And there was all this debate raging. And uh, so now, you know, two years later, we're, we're, we're happy that it happened that way. We're able to uh, cushion the blow and speed up the economy's adjustment. So that's been a positive thing about models. Uh, we do have, though, lots of other models. You mentioned one other, which we use is smaller, simpler, uh, more basic, which is used to complement uh, Totem, because Totem, frankly, is very sophisticated, uh, hard to uh, play with. Actually, you need, uh, you need a double PhD to, uh, <laughs> it seems, to play with it. Uh, but of course, it does have the, both of those models have the equipment to allow us to uh, analyze housing price <coughs> declines, for example, if you're instant in a shock like that. And we have other models that we use for financial stability risks. So, um, and there we've got all the financial institutions modeled and their interconnectivity captured. And in there we do the actual shock that we talk about in the financial system review uh, to kind of capture what kind of GDP impact might be happening from a, a basic shock, how much magnification there would be. Uh, and finally, we have launched uh, the work on the next generation of model, which is to replace Totem uh, someday. And I do this because I know that uh, Totem's predecessor was started in the mid, uh, well, actually in about late 80s, around 1990. Uh, and so it took well over 20 years for us to go from there to what we use today as Totem. And so I know that I'm never going to see this completed, but it is my job to give people a license <laughs> to invest now uh, for something that we may only begin to use in production, say, 10 years from now, hopefully sooner. But uh, <laughs> there's no doubt that uh, there's lots of new things going on that we need to uh, build in and uh, you know, elaborate upon. So thanks for your question. Thank you very much. So we're coming to a close. I think we're right on time, one minute late. So thank you very much to the panelists. I think it has been a great panel. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Gorola. Thank you. Oh, Rico. Thank you. Great. Not so fast. We're now coming to the final part. And we have 10 students who have worked a hell of a lot and who will now come onto the stage to be awarded, one of them, with the final prize. So I'm going to call you all onto the stage, starting with Andrada Bilan. Martin de Rida,
Miguel Faria e Castro. Alexandra Fotiu. Elena Gerko. Gregory Howard. Mengqiang Huang. Jean-Marie Maya. Pierluca Panella. And Tommaso Sono. And now I have the honor to ask the president onto the stage who will explain and enlighten us as to who won the award. So um, now, I I have now the pleasure to announce the winner of the prize for the best paper in the Young Economist poster session. Um, I hope you had the time to take a look at the posters, and I wish to thank those of you who helped the selection committee to rate them by casting an electronic vote. Uh, before I announce the name of the winner, let me say a few things about all papers included insightful research analysis and reached interesting conclusions. Selecting the best among these 10 posters was certainly a difficult task. So let me thank the members of the selection committee, Philip Hartman, the chairman, Ines Cabral, and Peter McAdam, and two external leading academics, John Mulbauer, professor of economics at Nuffield College and Oxford, and Ricardo Rice, professor of economics at Columbia University and the London School of Economics. Posters have been rated along two dimensions, academic quality and policy relevance. Given that they have been chosen from over, from over 100 submissions, all of the 10 shortlisted papers were excellent. However, there must be a winner. And I'm particularly happy to say that the recipient of the 10,000 euros prizes for the best poster at this year ECB Forum in Sintra is Ms. Venkiam Waung from the Timbergen University in Amsterdam with the paper Central Party Capitalization and Misaligned Incentives. Please. Yeah, sure. I will, here, three, three, six, no, perhaps here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Before concluding this fourth ECB Forum, let me take the opportunity to thank all of you for your contributions towards making it a success. Over the past few days, we've had many valuable insights from Ben's thought-provoking speech on Monday night to the analysis of papers presented yesterday and today, to the lively and inspiring debates that followed during the different sessions. All of this provides food for thought for our work over the coming weeks and months and can inspire our future research and policy work. Finally, let me thank the organizing team of the ECB, including the staff from the Bank of Portugal, for this uh, very hard and very good job they've done. And I look forward to see you again next year. Thank you. Thank you.